Welcome. We are going to cover chapter one, the technical overview. And this is the introductory chapter to the textbook, X3D Graphics for Web Authors. And there's quite a bit of material in this chapter. The chapter itself is available online. Uh, it can be uh, downloaded from the x3dgraphics.com website. And we wrote this chapter as a way of telling the story, both the history behind virtual reality modeling language, Web3D consortium, the development of the X3D specification, but also what does it mean from a graphics perspective? What are the technical issues involved? How is it architected? What are the capabilities? Uh, what are the different uh, details about how things work? What are the different file formats and encodings and languages that can be used together with X3D? So that's a tall order. There's a lot of stuff to talk about there. And it's also one of those topics that uh, you have to make accessible to people who haven't used X3D, but would also be accessible and meaningful to experts perhaps in other forms of 3D graphics, we're coming to X3D for the first time and saying, can I use this technology? Can I take my past knowledge, merge it into X3D, take advantage of that, and still not forget that first group, the people who are using XML or they've made web pages or folks that just want to learn it, maybe, maybe just like you, and say, well, okay, that's where it came from, this is where it's going but I don't need to know every technical detail. Okay, so how do you hit high-low? What we tried to do in this chapter, in this slide set, is provide the necessary background so that you get it, but not make it a prerequisite to further work in the course. And so you can watch this chapter first and uh, go through this slide set and then go right into the, the next chapter without worrying, did I follow every single detail? There's no dependency between the first chapter and the subsequent chapters. No, no strict dependency, at least, for can I make it work? Nevertheless, you might want to know it before you go there. So, uh, rather than me decide, it's better if you decide. You could uh, skim through this material flip through the written chapter, flip through the slides, and go, okay, okay, uh, I'm not sure what that is. I want to go edit. I want to go author some 3D. It's perfectly fine to go ahead to chapter two and start moving right along. Okay, so uh, what is in here? Here we go. This uh, summarizes what we talk about. Our goal really is to give you a quick coverage, quick introduction. Uh, at the same time, want to be thorough. So it's interesting in class this quarter, what we've done is uh, jump right ahead to chapter two. We didn't give this presentation right away. We instead got through the first five chapters and then went back to chapter one and visited it in some detail. You might find that approach valuable too. Okay, so why X3D? What's it all about? What motivated us? Well, first off, it's been around for quite a while, uh, perhaps longer than most other 3D graphics technologies. The, uh, that's because our basis is in virtual reality modeling language. This is a standard that uh, was first considered back in 94. In fact, it was motivated by HTML. Uh, hypertext markup language, the language for web pages. And uh, a bunch of folks said, well, gee whiz, if we can do that for multimedia, if we can do it for documents, put links in there and images, why can't we do it for 3D graphics? So, in fact, the earliest name of Vermal was not modeling language, it was virtual reality markup language. Could we pattern that closely after? HTML. And we realized, well, we want to, and there's many overlaps, many similarities that we could address, but it's one step further. It's really modeling. It's not just marking up text, but we're building models and putting them together. Okay, so how could we get there from, from uh, just a, 
a dead stop and, and get momentum in a positive direction. The challenge became, well, it's not that we couldn't do it, it's that there's a couple of ways to do it. And people didn't always see eye to eye or have the same designs or the same motivations. So what we did was we held a competition. And uh, this initial beauty contest was, was uh, considered by volunteers, by folks who were interested in saying, well, I want to work on it, I want to contribute, I want to help. Let's start making a list of the strengths, of the shortfalls, of the benefits that might not be there by any of them. And so when we looked at uh, a handful of submissions against the uh, criteria, there was a, a clear winner. And that was uh, a technology called Open Inventor, an application programming interface which also had a file format. And that was very influential. At the same time, it was not exclusive. We didn't just say, oh, Open Inventor, we're all done. Instead, that was the basis. Numerous good ideas from the other submissions were on the table and we said, okay, how could we merge some of these? We got the best of both worlds. We got a quick start and we got uh, a solid architecture to build from and then uh, uh, the ability to go forward, add features, go beyond what the original designers of Open Inventor had in mind. Okay, so that took us all of three years, which was lightning fast. Uh, this has uh, helped define the meaning of internet time. Things moved very quickly. And we got from a 1.0, uh, which mostly sort of worked and some architectural flaws were discovered, to a 2.0, which deliberately corrected those, meaning it broke backwards compatibility with 1.0. And uh, then we started adding features in a more robust, more extendable, more scalable way. So we made it say, this is good enough that we went all the way to ISO and got it blessed. It's really important to pay attention to the fact that how did they do this stuff? How did, how did this marriage of technology and politics uh, actually succeed? It was by cooperation. There was no single company no single individual who owned it or controlled it or said, it must be my way. It's been group, group effort ever since the very beginning. And uh, we can pay, uh, we should give a lot of credit to Mark Pesci and Tony Parisi, the folks who first proposed this at the SIGGRAPH conference in 1994, and of course all the many, many people who've joined this effort over the years. Okay, in 97, as it became an international standard, we kept answer, getting asked the question, who, who are you guys anyway? Who, who is this community? And it was critical that we maintain that sense of community, the openness of it, the ability for people to contribute ideas and questions, and possible improvements. But at the same time, we didn't want it to completely randomize or fall apart over time. We said, you know, we need some type of stable structure to protect it. So this is why we launched the Web3D Consortium. And uh, not to exclude the community, but rather to give it a foundation to be effective and to make it even more businesslike, to let different companies, agencies, universities, and interested professionals, professionals to come in and say, we're part of the team, we're working together, we're going to make this stuff happen. Parenthetically, lest we forget, we also didn't want it to get stolen or torpedoed or killed. There has been a long history in 3D graphics of very competitive uh, players. And so we didn't want to be part of the graphics war du jour, the graphics uh, API battle of this year or that year. Rather, we wanted to have a stable interchange platform so that web interactivity, web interoperability might go forward. Probably, the, if we think about the many factors there, the single most important from a business sense is royalty free free for any purpose, just like HTML, just like the rest of the web technologies, that we could work 
with the rest of the web. Okay, so uh, Web3D Consortium. Here's our picture from a few months ago. Heck, let's go there right now and see what today's web page says. Okay, web3d.org. See if I can spell today. Here we are, all sorts of stuff. You can see uh, we've had a, a busy week. And when you start drilling down in this uh, uh, web page, we just got back from the Web3D Symposium, which is our uh, annual conference event, and SIGGRAPH, the uh, uh, Special Interest Group on Graphics, the professional society for computer graphics and interactive techniques. So uh, web3d.org. Uh, changes uh, at least on a weekly basis with press releases by our members, with uh, case studies, with all sorts of news, events, and uh, reference resources for people to work with. Okay, so Web3D Consortium. Let's go ahead and add today's page right to the slide set. In fact, if you drill down into the uh, slides, you'll find that um, we've got a series of them every month or so I'll uh, even it changes weekly I can't keep up with them all but every month or so I'll take another screen snapshot and we'll see how the website is evolving over time here are a few right there working backwards okay what's next specifications this is the cornerstone of what we've done the specifications say this is how it works. This is what an X3D scene is all about. How do you define geometry, colors, appearance, materials, behaviors, structures, simulations? How does this grand mix come together? That's where the rubber hits the road. That's where the hardest of the hard work comes from. Can we get a document that unambiguously describes the functionality of X3D. And we have succeeded in doing that, not through some magical wave of the wand, but rather by steady effort, due diligence, lots of people commenting, every possible comment getting considered and addressed. Fix them whenever we can. Put them on the to-do list or doesn't belong here list when we can and step by step going forward. That rigor is an important part of the value. Can we make a standard that works with the rest of the web? And to make sure that we do that, we send it off to the uh, International Organization of Standards, ISO, and uh, there's the link right there, and uh, different national bodies review X3D not just the original spec, but about every uh, 12 or 18 months when we post revisions, uh, 8 to 10 to 12 nations will take their technical experts and go through it and make sure the changes are satisfactory. Uh, in, in the United States, that national body is called ANSI, A-N-S-I, the uh, Amer American National Standards Institute. Okay, they get to be one of the voting members. So anyway, why do we need a standard? And a lot of people will say, we don't need standards. A lot of people in graphics will say that. If graphics is too cool, it's too busy, it's too changing, that a standard inhibits progress. It just slows things down. Well, I don't believe that. Some people do, but I don't. I think that if we look at graphics that look at it from a non-expert perspective, if we ask, ask somebody about it, you know, if you ask a, a young person or, or somebody who's not in the field and you say, hey, what's, tell me what 3D graphics is all about, you'll, get, you'll probably get one or two answers. The first one would be, well, it's all about games, or we just saw that cool movie the other day and frankly some of the 3D is so good we can't tell if it's real or it's made up. We, we saw something that we know is impossible but it looked perfectly realistic. Okay, well if that's what most people know about 3D, 
What they didn't say is, oh yeah, I just made a 3D model the other day. Or, I have this other model that I want to use. Or, I like this one and I like that one. Let's hook them together. Let's see if we can get them to run. And you go, wait a minute, wait a minute, that, that won't work. These are different tools. These are different things. So yes, cool is cool. It's great that we can do all these great things. It's not so great that we can't publish it to the web. It's also, it's also I think, revealing that even if models are visibly understandable, if we take somebody's machine, if one, if one expert or one player, they say, I know, let's trade, let's, let's I'll run yours if you run mine. Sorry, that's another embarrassing question you're not supposed to ask. Why? Because the keyboard is different, or the mouse is different, or the interaction is different. So there's this lack of consistency in how things go. And for some gamers, you know, oh, they don't care about that. They just say, yeah, I'm in this, doing this mode here, or that mode there. But that's a special skill. And it can lead to uh, strange results. So I think it's telling that no two experts can run the same demo, so or run each other's demos. So why can't we get past that? There are examples where we have gotten past that in uh, in uh, in the web. So let's try to do that. Okay. So why else is it? Uh, important. Well, it makes a bigger market. There are a lot of companies doing great 3D work, but it tends to be for a fairly small audience, forever, for whoever is hiring them, who gets perhaps locked into the technology that they are using, uh, and that is very small playing field. Um, it can be much bigger. Uh, some of these ideas weren't just uh, overnight notions, but some of these ideas actually developed over time, and, and it wasn't until we started looking backwards that we saw why it, why it worked. I, I've been fortunate. Working in Web3 has allowed me to go to uh, a very big organization, the World Wide Web Consortium, and be their representative, uh, be, their li be the liaison to Web3D. And they have so many specifications, so many recommendations, it's unbelievable. It makes our, our 3D efforts look, look fairly uh, modest by comparison. When they have meetings, there'll often be uh, 200, maybe 300 people in the room representing about 400 different companies and agencies. And here's a question I've never heard in eight years of going to meetings. The question I've never yet heard is, my company doesn't know how to make money off this web standard. And you know they're asking that question because they're paying money to join and they have to justify their, their annual budget and so on and so forth. So the web is a very big space. If we count up all the people who know 3D, who know experts, know some kind of expert knowledge, we say, okay, if we add up, we had 28,000 people in Los Angeles last week going to SIGGRAPH. Okay, so 30,000 people a year integrated a tale over 30 years of SIGGRAPH history. And then maybe throw in all the gamers, uh, go to game development conference or others. Okay, so how many people have been to a graphics conference? Uh, 300, 400, 500,000? Half a million, maybe, maybe a million? That, that sounds like a lot. How many people have created web pages? How many people use web pages? Half a million, maybe creeping towards a million. If, if, if that's here, all the people working on the web is way up at the ceiling. Far, far bigger play space. So is a standard important? Yes, if it lets our 3D stuff get out of the box of specialty, unique, one-of-a-kind, can't connect with anything else. And it lets 3D become a shared medium where we can use it like video or images or documents to say, I want to tell my story, I want to build another story, I want to get stuff 
working together. Okay, so there's plenty of motivation here. How did we execute when it came time to work on a specification? Well, this is called our honeycomb diagram. And uh, in uh, Vermal 97, the standard prior to X3D, it was one big monolithic document. And as we kept adding functionality, it got harder and harder for people to keep straight. Well, wait a minute, what part is here? And what are we updating? And did it change something else? And so when we went from the second generation VRML to the third generation X3D, we did a couple of things. This, this was a big part of it. First, we took out all the functionality and made it language neutral, meaning it's not just C++, not just Java, not just VRML format. We said, what does it do? How does it work? What does it look like? What are the parameters? We wrote that in an agnostic kind of way. It wasn't tied to a given format, and we put it right in the middle. We said, this is the functional abstract specification. So that was a pretty big uh, you know, editing task to make sure that we didn't break any of the writing. But once it was there, we were then able to say, OK, we've got that. Now we can go around the horn and say, how does that look using XML? How does that look using our classic verbal encoding? Can we maintain backwards compa compatibility with uh, Vermal itself? Answer, yes, we can. Can we add a new capability of compressed binary? Yes, we can. Yes, we did. And then finally, JavaScript and Java. We did that too. So it says ECMAScript here. That's, that's the formal spec name, the wonky term for JavaScript. Why? Because there are a few flavors of JavaScript out there. And since we're the formal guys, we use the uh, <coughs> formal version. And that's the document we reference. OK, so uh, and then soon to come, we hope, there's been two people who've done the C++ version. And so they're pretty satisfied it's stable. So we'll probably write that up soon. So that means. People can use whatever coding they want to build X3D browsers and players, but authors, when they create things, can say, I could use any one of these files. I could use any one of these coding techniques, and it's still the same. It's still the same X3D. None of those documents need to re-describe the functionality. They just say, here's how you say it. And the middle one says, here's how you do it. OK, so uh, the big progress for the group, because given that, we were much better able then to use it and further extend it. And uh, I think it's telling that uh, uh, when you go to our website, you don't find a list of, here are all the things we did wrong and we're now redoing. Takes a little longer to get a standard through, but it only gets through till it's stable, and it works for lots of people. So that's the good news. We don't have to reinvent stuff all the time. It also means that the X3D specification is a direct resource for anybody to use. In fact, I'm pretty sure Web3D was the first group to get permission from ISO to publish their standard online as as good old HTML web pages. Because ISO, their, their, their business model, they, they help underwrite their operations by charging people to buy copies of the specification. Un understandable. It costs them money to do their things. But we said, wait a minute, you know, that, that won't work for us. We're a web standard. It has to be on the web. This is a big part of XML and HTML, why they work. So ISO agreed. And they, will allow, they allow us to publish it online. In fact, we distribute it far and wide. Uh, uh, so, uh, if you want, you can still go back to the ISO site and pay them, uh, uh, I think you're paying euros uh, to buy a PDF or a hardbound copy. You can still do that, but you don't have to. You can get the free version. Okay. 
That means anybody can use a spec as yet another resource. But those specs are kind of hard to read because they're not written for the general public. They're not written for web authors. The spec is written for software implementers and they have to be very strict and unambiguous so people can build software that's consistent. Okay, so uh, it's there as a resource, but this is why we ended up writing the book. Uh, frankly, I think we wrote it because nobody else did first. <laughs> I, w I probably would have been uh, quite content to just keep working on the spec and doing stuff, but we needed a book that told people how to use it, and so that's why we did it. The spec remains a great supplement. Here's how you get it online. We further embedded it in the authoring tool for the course, and we also welcome feedback. Let's test that. Here's the feedback link. Okay, I did not need a password to get into this page. It says, who are you? How do we reach you back to make sure we understand your comment and tell us what you think? Please be precise so it's not a, what do you think about triangles? But rather, it points out something that we could improve or could fix. So that's part of our being open. Okay, what else? I think that uh, uh, something that's held true every step of the way, big part of our success is that it's a sense of community, individuals contributing, working in good faith, cooperating to build stuff together. That's what's let us tackle any problem and solve many of them. Okay? Usually this is accomplished via working groups. It's not by one person jumping up and saying, do it my way, but rather a handful of people with maybe a larger group watching saying, these are our goals, and this is the functionality we want to add, and this is what success looks like. Once you have those charter goals defined, then a group can iterate through what are our options, and what are our constraints, and how do we get there, and did this result or that result not break anything else. That usually uh, takes time. Uh, six months, 12 months, uh, not working overnight every single day, but typically a, maybe a phone conference once or twice a week, uh, excuse me, every one week or two weeks, and an email. A lot of it's done by email, and uh, it's a successful pro process. Nothing succeeds like success. Okay, a little more on ISO. Uh, we think, we hope, that these approvals further assist in the deployment of 3D graphics by letting, uh, letting them get adopted by governments as part of their policies. Many world governments have pretty strict rules about whether you can use a technology or not. It has to be a recognized standards body so that they're not locking into a vendor, they're not becoming vulnerable to a technology that might come or go or be flawed. And so this is uh, part of our success. We mentioned W3C, here it is again. Um, uh, to get to the W3C site, it's at uh, w3.org. And that's a pretty interesting place. They've got a lot of stuff there. And uh, frankly, it's typically one of the top 10 visited websites on the planet, which is astonishing if you look at some of the other nine or the other top 100. Most of them are very commercial. To think that a standards related organization gets that much traffic is amazing. But that is ground zero for what's going on on the web. And we, uh, we work hard to stay completely compatible with everything they do. Uh, you may be interested in helping. We're always looking for people, for Web3D Consortium members, or for W3C members who want to work on tasks of mutual interest. Right now, a big one is uh, HTML version 5. Huge effort going on there. We want to stay plugged into that. Here's uh, W3C's current web page. Uh, down in the lower left hand corner, A to Z, that list goes on and on and on. There's several dozen working groups, active and busy, at any given time. 
We also uh, get to say, why do we care about W3C? Why do we participate? Because just like them, we support open standardization. We're trying to achieve real-time 3D communication. We're taking the web to another level, perhaps uh, one level up or bigger, a third dimension to augment all the other things going on. Very cool challenges. Also, uh, uh, some problems are very hard they will tackle. Videos right there front and center. We are uh, also contributing and closely tracking the video work going on. Okay, so why else does this standards business matter? Well, intellectual property rights, it turns out, are a big part of that. Whether or not a technology can be used with fees or without fees. This is usually controlled by patents. Patents that get filed, they're legal documents. They govern, if they're approved, whether somebody can use a given technology or not. I am not a lawyer. There's an acronym for that, I-A-N-A-L. Uh, it's a common statement, but it's been very interesting to observe how the legal environment affects the technical environment. How it also affects the business environment, how well things are able to propagate. So what our stance is on, a legal, on intellectual property rights is that we can consider patents, but we won't approve them unless they go royalty free for ultimate web use. So this is a kind of a nice middle ground because it makes very clear to everybody we're not going to break some of the principles that make the web work. Okay, if somebody somewhere was collecting a tenth of a penny every time you clicked on a web link, it's very questionable whether the web would have ever taken off and scaled and grown. Okay, we can't possibly break that. We can't say X3D doesn't flow with that. On the other hand, there are companies with very big investments and very good technology and say, well, we own a patent on this and we think it might help. Okay, so let's have the dialogue. Web3D Consortium gives us that safe haven for people to get together, talk, work, discuss, improve things in good faith, knowing at the end of the day, if it's accepted, it will <coughs> go forward. It will be royalty free. It will help with the web. If it's not accepted, okay, no harm, no foul. Dear XYZ company or university, thank you very much for submitting your technology. Here it is right back. We've decided it's not appropriate. And be, by we, I do not mean me. I mean we, the Web3D Consortium members, who vote on this stuff. And so if you want to join, please do. There's the link. This also inoculates us from a, a very real failure mode we've seen in some other standards groups. Some groups say, well, we just want to do good technical work, so we'll, we'll worry about that legal stuff later. Technical work's pretty hard sometimes. It takes six months, a year, maybe, maybe two years if it's really hard. And you get to the finish line and say, okay, okay, the engineers deliver. Here's our solution that solves the problem. And then the lawyers go, okay, thank you, thank you, boys. Uh, go sit down, we'll get back to you later. Uh, we'll decide how much that's going to cost and who gets to use it. Boy, would that deflate a balloon for a lot of people. We have seen groups hit that wall. And then the engineers, not all of whom are in this royalty mode, say, why did I just spend two years of my life working on technology that is not going to deploy? There are a number of people who say, I, I won't go there. Okay, so this is why we, as members, people sign the IPR document saying, if I have patented technology, I will pre-declare it, not wait until the end of the process and say, oh yeah, yeah, uh, by the way, I, I forgot to tell you guys, I had a patent on this thing, and, and we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna assert that. Those are sometimes called, uh, interestingly, they're called submarine patents because they float along under the surface and pop up at the last minute. 
So we inoculate ourselves against submarine patents and say, pre-declare, keeping all your rights in this safe haven, pre-declare that it will go open, free, open royalty free if accepted. And if not, fine, you haven't lost your investment. Nobody's going to uh, reveal your technology. So this long story, there's other references in the notes. My uh, personal take is that we can solve any legal problem, but only in advance. Some legal problems are so gnarly you get into a limbo, there's no way out of them. So the best thing is don't go there. And that's what our policy protects us from getting stuck in. Okay, so what's next? Open standards are one thing. How do we exchange data consistently? Open source is another. And it's, and it's a good thing not to confuse those. There's a good relationship between the two, but they're not the same thing exactly. Open source means the software is free for use without license fees. And that primary freedom, you know, a lot of people think about, well, it doesn't cost me anything. It's sort of like free beer, hey. We're having a party now. But it's, it's more like, well, it's freedom to fix a bug, freedom to improve it, freedom to make sure it still works. So a lot closer probably to a free puppy than free beer. What else does open source do? Well, a common misconception, a confusion that, that hit a lot of us at some point was it could be an example implementation of the functionality of the spec. But what it's not is a reference implementation. And sometimes people use that term, reference implementation. Well, if you read the spec mock stuff strictly and you say reference implementation, then usually that means unless you implement it just like that source code, you don't comply. You're not, you're, you're not the same as the reference. The standard. So we go, oh, oh, okay. So we want sample implementations that implement. We don't want to tell everybody, you must write your software right like this, because the software guys will say, get out of here. The, the men and women who make the code are, are very independent, fiercely individualistic. They know, especially in a performance driven thing like 3D graphics, they have very strong ideas about how they want to do it. So we are not a reference implementation. There are other goodnesses involved with uh, uh, open source. This used to be less clear. It's pretty clear to a lot of people that open source uh, is an effective business model. It's not the same as a closed source model, but there are different ways to charge money, to get support, to make things work. It's uh, particularly helpful if uh, people are migrating from job to job. It's not a nice thing to work for a few years in a company and then when it's time to move to another job, say, oh, sorry, all of your work is no longer available to you. I hope, I hope people who do that get paid sufficiently, get paid properly for that effort, but that has to be a, a worry. That, that limits their, uh, uh, how do we say, migratability, I guess, uh, their ability to jump to other things. So open source can be uh, useful in a number of different ways. We found actually that there was one other benefit to open source that we hadn't foreseen first, and this came in the years after Vermal 97. Part of our rules for the standard, we took this from the Engin Internet Engineering Task Force, the IETF, and it said, if you want to show that a standard is interoperable, then you should test that by interoperating. And so we said, okay, the interoperability test was you will have two implementations and they both work. So we did that. And that rule got maybe interpreted or bent a little. Since Thermal 97 was a fairly big spec, not everybody had done everything, but there were four or five players implementing, and we said, well, as long as there's at least two implementations of each feature, then that'll be good enough. And the group, as it was organized then, was very scrupulous and a lot of due diligence trying to make it just right. Okay, so after the fact, after it's all approved, 
we found, well, there were still some things that didn't quite work consistently or didn't work the way people expected. And, and they were controversial issues. They were hard to, to understand. I mean, technically complex. Even with examples, people might say, well, you did it your way, but I don't agree with how you read the spec. I did it my way. And, and I'm right, you're wrong. No, I'm right, you're wrong. Oh, what are we going to do here? Uh, when it comes to software development for coders, since I'm not talking about authors now, people making 3D scenes, but I'm talking about the software writers who build the browsers, the viewers for these things. Well, my extrusion doesn't look like your extrusion. Okay. There's a, there's a great way to touch bottom on that among coders. They say, show me your code. Show me your source. Go, okay. Well, I can't. You show me your source. Let's look at that. Well, I can't. Why not? Because Well, my company won't allow me to release any source, even in this trusted haven. You know, it's a, it's a part of our intellectual property. It's part of our competitive advantage because we want to be faster and better than anybody else. Of course, if the extrusion looks one, one way and the other way, then that sort of undercuts every, everybody's competitive advantage. So how do we reconcile it? Well, uh, we need some source sometimes to get down to the technical details to say why didn't it work, why are we misunderstanding. So we changed our rules for X3D just slightly. We still need two independent interoperable implementations that we can test. But we said one of them must be open source. At least one must be open so that there's always some code to look at. And so that's the long story behind the short bullet here that having that open source lets us reconcile some of those well-intentioned but very gnarly technical problems that can sometimes emerge. And so that has served us well. And uh, so we don't, what we're not saying is everybody must write open source. No, not at all. It's very good that companies might have proprietary, high performance, special advantage software. That gets them money so they can do even more good things. But it means at least there's something in the middle that people can point to and compare to and say, oh, I understand what you're saying now. No, change the code this way and it's like what I'm saying. Oh, I see what you're doing. Okay, we can meet in the middle finally and go forward. Having these different sources has definitely helped us. Okay, well, if that wasn't gnarly enough for you, here's another legal type top. Digital rights management. How can people control or sign or have some kind of uh, uh, repeatable statement about their property, their 3D models that they built? This is still a very busy area legally, and there's a lot of question marks, and there's many different ways of doing it. Because most of the ways of doing it tend to be tied to one company or another company X3D has, an inten has intentionally stayed back from that fray. Unless there is an open web standard for doing something, we're probably not too interested in muddying the waters further. We'd be happy to coexist with other things, uh, uh, but we don't want to make it even harder to get out there. So, some good news. One of the benefits of getting into an XML encoding for X3D is that we get to piggyback on all things XML. So we can use encryption. We can make sure that uh, uh, there it's provable, or we can make sure that you have privacy or control over your data if you don't want your model to be seen by somebody else. We can also use XML digital signature to authenticate it. Non-repudiability. The ability to say, I signed it. I did it. That's my watermark. Some authors would really like that. So this combination of things means that we can do that. And so we've got, uh, in, uh, okay, thank you, Mr. Virus Guy. How do we get out of this? Thing? Uh, back, here we are, finally. Okay, so what do we have? We can 
encrypt it to protect it. We can sign it to make sure it's there. There's also ways to distribute keys with XML. Oh, we got all of that for free. So if you're really interested in DRM, we're pretty far down that road, but we're not going to go any farther than what the marketplace already has and what stays open. So if you're interested in where that's going, I could recommend uh, looking at the Open Media Commons effort. That's quite interesting. That's not a X3D standard. Okay, so let's, let's sum it up. Here's something, uh, here are four different words that I often see confused or used interchangeably uh, out in the press, out in big name panels, people talking, and I think it's good to get our, our, our jargon straight, our terms of reference straight here to understand it. So standards are, there's a proven process for people the spec is the technical description of how things work. Open source is code, software that hopefully works and may or may not be implementing a patented algorithm. So you could get open source, but it might be a patented algorithm, so you couldn't necessarily use it freely. You could change the source, you could fix a bug, but you might not be able to use it without paying money. Different thing. And then finally, market share dominance. There are lots of companies who've gone down this road and say, well, if we just, if everybody uses our stuff, it's sometimes called a de facto standard. The law of large numbers. Well, maybe, <laughs> maybe for you, but there's a long list of companies that have come and gone trying to repeat the example of one or two very big companies who may have a lock on a certain market and may be financially successful, but definitely are not the web, definitely are not open standards. So there's a difference. If you're clear on those, I think you're probably ahead of most people in saying, I understand how the field works. So our summary is this mix of things that lets us go forward and stay interoperable and partner with the right partners. So we're not reinventing existing work, but rather fitting into this global information infrastructure. Finding the win-win scenario for everybody is part of what we do. Okay, so that is the political overview. Next we're gonna do the technical overview.